The oceans make up more than 70% of the surface of the Earth. And us humans are justifiably fascinated by them. There's something about the vast expanse of shiny, shimmering water that helps us to think, that inspires us, that gives us peace. And that's just the surface of the ocean. If we're able to actually dive in and look underwater, we find a world filled with creatures of all shapes and sizes. But when most of us think about the underwater world, we're thinking of this. We're thinking of crystal clear blue water, colorful coral reefs like our very own, the world famous Great Barrier Reef. So did you know that in Australia we have another reef? It's actually a much longer reef. It's nearly as long as the Great Wall of China. It's 8,000 kilometers long. 70% of Australians live, work, and play right next to it. It contributes more than $10 million per year to the Australian economy. That's nearly double what the Great Barrier Reef contributes. And yet, I bet most of you have not heard of it. Well, let me introduce to you the Great Southern Reef, which also happens to be a pop for biodiversity, with many of its species being found nowhere else on Earth. Now, just in the same way as the Great Barrier Reef is defined by a network of corals, what connects the Great Southern Reef are these beautiful underwater seaweed forests like these ones. Now, these are some of the most productive ecosystems in the planet. Uh, in Australia, they support the two most valuable fisheries, that's the abalone fishery and the rock lobster fishery, and yet we know so little about them. And knowing less about them means we're less able to care about them. So I'd like to show you just some of the creatures that live in the Great Southern Reef. And um, this is uh, the weedy sea dragon. It's a bit of a personal favorite of mine. We can find this guy in reefs less than five kilometers from where we're standing right now. It's a fish. It's related to the seahorses. And like the seahorses, it is the males that carry the eggs. In this case, they tuck them underneath their tail instead of having a patch. Another wonderful great southern reef creature is the blue groper. Um, now these guys can do something pretty nifty, which is that they can change sex as they grow up. So it's only the males that are big and blue, and they live in social groups that are like harems. So there's one big male that is blue, surrounded by multiple females, which are brown, reddish brown. And then when the big blue male dies, one of the females changes color mm. and becomes a male. Well, that's kind of pretty cool. Um, here's another one, the giant cuttlefish. It is the largest cuttlefish in the whole world, and it's a native endemic species to the Great Southern Lake. And this is just to tell you about the, the, a few of the creatures that live here, and about which we know remarkably little. Now, as a marine biologist based here in Sydney, it is my privilege to spend a lot of my time researching um, these underwater forests, trying to understand them better and both the forests and the creatures that live within them. But unfortunately, and this is the bad news, uh, some of these seaweeds and some of these forests are in trouble. Uh, they're disappearing. So I want to show you one of my study sites, one of my most recent study sites. This is a place in northern New South Wales. This is close to the warm edge of distribution of kelp forests, and kelp are one of the most dominant seaweeds in the Great Southern Reef. And this is what these reefs looked like in the early 2000s. We see that the ocean floor is dominated by kelp. And that's a good thing. By the late 2000s, however, we see how some of the kelp is starting to disappear. Now, in 2011, there was no more kelp to be found, and there hasn't been any kelp since. In that site, the kelp has gone. Now, this, this decline of kelp is by no means unique to the east coast of Australia. The same thing is happening in the west coast of Australia, and it's even more dramatic. So here, we can see that there was a, a big heat wave, an extreme heat wave in 2011. And again, these are kelp forests near the warm edge of their distribution. We can see what the ocean floor, floor looked like before the heat wave. Plenty of kelp. After the heat wave, there's no more kelp to be found. Now, what my research is showing is that this is by no means unique uh, to Australia. It's a global phenomenon. Just have a look at how similar this is to what's happening in the southern coast of Japan. Again, early 90s, plenty of kelp, a very similar species to the one that we have here in Sydney. By the late uh, 90s, we can see that the kelp started to suffer, to struggle. 2000, we have a barren. In 2013, 
that ocean floor is actually dominated by something else, something completely different. It's corals, tropical corals. I did a study here in 2014, and when I was diving in this place called Tosa Bay, I couldn't believe that this used to be a kelp forest because it felt truly tropical now. So this is essentially the problem, that as the oceans are getting warmer, cool water species, like the kelp, are starting to disappear, and warm water species, like these corals, are starting to take over. And many of you will be thinking, well, what's wrong with that, right? What's wrong with more coral? Coral's beautiful. But of course, when we lose the kelp, we lose everything else that associates with it. So, and that's literally hundreds of species. This is data from the same place in Japan that I just showed you. And this is the abalone fishery, and we can see how it completely collapsed after the kelp disappeared. No kelp means no abalone fishery. And that's just to give you one example. So, I guess that just while a lot of us have been extremely concerned about the mass bleaching event that has been happening in the Great Barrier Reef recently, I'm afraid there's been another massive loss of habitat in the marine environment, and that's been the loss of the kelps. And I think that we need to be as concerned about the loss of kelps as we are about the loss of coral. But why is kelp disappearing? What are the main causes? Um, we know that pollution can be a problem. So excess nutrients, for example, not good for kelps. We also know that seaweeds get diseased, just like you and I. And we also know that warm water is a big problem. So these are cool water species, and they just get really stressed when the water gets too hot. But there's something else that is happening at the same time, and that's that the species are moving, they're shifting their distribution. Without a doubt, the most significant impact of climate change in marine ecosystems is that species are moving towards the coast to stay within their comfortable temperature ranges. And that means fish from the tropics are starting to intrude into kelp rocks. So here's four fish that we know are moving, they're shifting their distribution. These are all species that are very much at home in the Great Barrier Reef that are becoming increasingly abundant in places like Sydney. What all these fish have in common are that they're herbivores, so that means they're vegetarians, they eat seaweeds. In their native Great Barrier Reef, they eat so much seaweed that it's actually really hard to find any seaweed at all amongst the coral because they eat it before it grows up. Now what happens when these guys come into the Great Southern Reef where there's like hundreds and thousands of kilometers of seaweeds, they have a feast, they have an absolute feast. How do we know this? Because we do experiments. So this is an experiment where I put a bit of kelp in the solitary islands, that same place that I showed you, and I put a camera in front of it to see who's eating it. So this is a site that used to have kelp, but from where it's now disappeared. And this is what happens. This is a bit of video that shows that these warm water fish, they're called rabbit fish, they come in, they start munching at the kelp, and it literally takes a very large predator <laughs> to scare them away, because otherwise they just munch their way through it. And in fact, even this predator will only stop them for a few seconds before they... <laughs> They're called rabbit fish for a reason. Um, so, I've just told you about the bad news. Um, we have a problem, the kelp is disappearing, and as a marine biologist, a lot of my work is actually about this. It seems to be about documenting the time and trying to understand the reasons behind it. But there's a new wave of research um, that we're pushing for. It's a solutions-based research where we look at the graded ecosystems and we ask ourselves, with our knowledge, is there something that we can do to fix things? Can we give nature a helping hand and move from the graded ecosystem back to a healthy ecosystem. And this is the focus of the next story that I'm going to tell you about. This is the story of Kraywig. So Kraywig is a seaweed that makes gorgeous underwater forests like these ones, also native to the Great Southern Reef. And Kraywig gets its name because crayfish absolutely love it. So any cray crayfishers out here would know that if you want to catch crays, you go to where the Kraywig is because they live closely together. Crayweed also associates with abalone. And as I just said, crayweed, uh, crayfish and abalone are the two most valuable fish in Australia. So that just goes to show how important crayweed is. Now the story of crayweed goes like this. Crayweed used to be the dominant seaweed in Sydney and until the 70s or 80s from where it went completely missing. 
Now, people that used to swim or surf around Sydney in the 80s remember that the water quality back then used to be much, much worse than it is now. In fact, people remember surfing right next to what they called the Bondi cigars, which was essentially untreated sewage that was being dumped straight onto the shoreline. Now, that caused a lot of harm, and one of the things that disappeared was crazy. Now, since then, um, we've built deep ocean outfalls that bring treated sewage out into the deep ocean in pipes that are between two and four kilometers long. So the water quality now in Sydney is absolutely brilliant. We have more than 600 species of fish coming in and out of the harbour. We even get whales coming into Sydney Harbour. And yet the craving hasn't come back. So a few years ago, some of us from the University of New South Wales and the Sydney Institute of Marine Science got together uh, to do an experiment, a pilot experiment, where we transplanted cravy, one cravy at a time, uh, onto Sydney reefs. Just to see purely, the question was, is the water quality here now good enough for cravy to survive? And this is what a cravy patch looks like. And to our surprise, we found that not only did the cravy survive, but it, it, it had babies, it reproduced. It had hundreds of little cravy babies that Cravy babies grew up and they had babies of their own, and we're now into the third generation of Cravy in our pilot site. So, this is a Google Earth photo that just shows how, out of our initial patch, 20 square meters, we now have self propagating patches that are growing hundreds of meters away. So, we thought this is a very good and very rare good news environmental story. We wanted to tell the whole of Sydney about it, we wanted to tell the world about it. So, and we wanted help to actually bring back Cravey to the whole of the Sydney coastline, move beyond this pilot and scale study and onto the Sydney coastline. So we created this project called Operation Cravey. <laughs> and one of the first things that we did was to create a logo, um, an identity of sorts. So I approached a good friend of mine who's a great designer and said, can you help me? And he looked at me and go, you want a logo to save a seaweed? I mean, how hard can you get the job get? Uh, and he very quickly convinced us that we needed eyes. People have trouble relating to things that don't have eyes. So that's how Cray, <laughs> uh, Reggie Cray, our master, was born. We then created a crowdfunding campaign. This was before December, so just before Christmas. And we basically asked people to give an on the water tree this Christmas to help us restore Sydney's on the water forests. And the response was amazing. The day that we launched the project, we were on the ABC News, we were on Channel 9 News, and by Christmas Eve, we even made it to the BBC, we made it all the way to the UK. Everybody was talking about craving. And this resulted in our project being one of the fastest environmental projects to reach its target on our crowdfunding site, which was possible, in just five days. So in five days, we got enough money to restore four craving sites. And the campaign went on to give us enough money to do eight sites, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, I hope this story goes to show that there are some reasons to be optimistic about the state of our oceans. Without a doubt, uh, our oceans are in trouble. They're definitely under threat, but we're getting better and better at understanding them. We're getting better at understanding what we need to do to protect them. And I think the Kravitz story is a really good example of how when you give nature a helping hand, its ability to help itself is truly remarkable. Thank you.